Okay, so we'll begin. We're holding the Kavot Perik Hamishi, the fifth chapter, Mishnah Vav. The following Mishnah is one of the most unusual Mishnayot in the entire Pirkei Avot. As you will see, the items that are listed here are very unusual, very cryptic, not the typical. The past few months we've done Pirkei Avot, we've gone through the various advice that the rabbis give us in many areas of life. Advice that was good back then and is good still today. In this last chapter, we're dealing with lists, whether they're lists of 10 or lists of seven or four, various categories of all kinds of things that are relevant, of course, to the Jewish people and Judaism. In this Mishnah, we're going to be dealing with the unusual, with the paranormal, not the typical. One of the, the most important, I guess, tenets in Judaism is that a Kadosh Baruch Hu is involved in this world. They not only create the world, but he's involved in every aspect of it. And part of his hashgaha, part of his divine providence or his interaction with this world is observable and part of it is not observable. And even that which is observable, sometimes it appears as something natural. We call it nature. And sometimes it's supernatural, what we call a miracle. And people have problems with the miracle part. With nature, they don't have a problem because they observe it every day. They don't realize that even nature is a miracle. Even the fact that we wake up every morning, Baruch Hashem, our life is restored to us, is not something to take for granted. And for that, the rabbis composed a special prayer, Modea ni lefanecha, right? That we thank you, God Almighty, for restoring to us the life that we had yesterday. Some people didn't wake up this morning. So we don't take anything for granted. Life is precious. The creation of the world is something very unique and precious, and it's purposeful. Everything is purposeful. And what that means is that it's by design. When an architect and an engineer and a contractor get together to build a building, they obviously plan it out. They need to design it. It's complex. You want to make sure you get it right, the building material, all the details, the dimensions, and the reason they put so much effort into it, money and, and time, is because it serves a purpose. In, besides being a good investment for the builder, it's intended to serve some purpose and it has to be built in a certain way. And so is the world. And there's so many billions or trillions of, of details in this world, it's probably even more than that, we can't even count, details that are not really known to us. Forget about not observable. There are things that are known but are not observable. There are things that are not even known to us that go into the creation of this world. And from the various passages in the Torah, the various Midrashim, the Zohar, the Talmud, it becomes clear to any Jew who learns Torah that everything is there for a reason. Nothing was created for no reason. If it's created, that means the architect, the God Almighty, wanted this thing to be created. It serves some purpose. It may be of limited. Uh, purpose. Like some people ask, what happened to the dinosaurs? Were, were they ever around? Of course, you can find their fossils, you see their, their bones. Nobody denies that they did not exist. They were created for a purpose. That purpose apparently is no longer necessary. There's no need for it. And therefore they're gone. But we're not going to get into when they existed now, when they disappeared. That's another topic. But we know that they serve the purpose, otherwise why create them? So here we have things that were created Erev Shabbat, Ben Hashem Ashot. Asarat Devarim Nivra'u Be'erev Shabbat Ben Hashem Ashot. We know the world was created in six days. What happened on the seventh day? God rested. What is the purpose of the rest? God doesn't need to rest. It means that this world, the created world, the physical world that we see, is limited. It will only last so long. It has a purpose, and that purpose, whenever it's done with, will finish. It doesn't mean everything will cease to exist. There will be still some sort of existence in this world, but it will be different kind of an existence, not the existence that we know of. 
we know of the physical existence, even though life has been transformed, and today everybody has an i5, iPhone 5, something like that, right? Mm -hmm. So that was not around a year ago. <laughs> so things change, but still it's the physical world, the way, more or less, the way we, we know it to be. That will not be so when Mashiach comes, that will not be after the year 6,000. That will be more of a spiritual world, a world which we do not really have too much information on. Hashem mechadeshet olamo, God will renew his, the, the, the creation. So we have a clear tradition on that. And part of the tradition is inferred from the creation of six days. The world is created in six days. Every day is a thousand years. Not every day back then was a thousand years, even though there are some opinions that every day was a thousand years. We, we abide by the opinion that it was 24 hours because the Pasuk says, so, you know, the night came, the day came, so we don't have to make any uh, wild guesses. Uh, perhaps they were a million years, and that's why, you know, the world is millions of years. No, the world is 5,773 years, according to the tradition. And every day of creation was 24 hours. Nonetheless, they correspond to 1,000 years. So we have 6,000 year world, six day wor uh, of creation. And these six days represent the physical creation. Then comes Shabbat, a day of rest, a day of no creation, a day of, 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 uh, of connecting to God. Shabbat ve nafash, God doesn't need to rest, but it's, it's a time that he, he focuses on other things. Let's put it that way. In other words, there was six days where the focus was one. Shabbat, the focus is something different. For us, the focus, of course, is Shabbat is connecting to God. It's spiritual. It's not physical. We don't work. We don't involve ourselves with this world. We don't listen to TV, to radio, even if it's on. Before Shabbat, we didn't touch it, right? It has nothing to do with that. In other words, we do away with that physical world so we can connect with God, and we connect with our family. It's a different kind of an experience. So Shabbat ben Afash Hashem does not need to rest, but it's a different experience. And then there is a twilight zone. Not the movie, not the show that some of you perhaps recall, yeah. right? Twilight zone means in between day and night. We don't know when Shabbat is exactly. All we know is after 18 minutes, after candle lighting, it's Shabbat. We don't take a chance. Ben Hashem Mashot is in between day and night. And it's a safek in the halakha, whether it's day or night. We don't take a chance. As soon as a woman lights her candles, it's Shabbat for her. A man technically has 18 minutes if he needs them, if he really needs them, until the Shekiah, the sunset. After sunset, it's Shabbat. Hashem knows exactly the time whether it's right when the first star comes out, or right before a little bit, we don't know exactly. But for us, therefore, we don't take a chance. Ben Hashem Ashot, it's still Shabbat. Whether it's Saturday, it's still Shabbat. If you can't make Avdalah, whether it's Friday, and it's already Shabbat. But this period of time called Ben Hashem Ashot, between the suns, between the moon and the sun, twilight, which is dark, but not completely dark. The stars are not out yet. Several things were created then. You know, when you read Bereshit, you think that's it. You know, the world is created, everything in a different day. Then you have this list over here. Asarat varim nivreu, the Erev Shabbat, ben Hashem Mashot. What are they? So I'm quickly going to go through them, and then I'm going to explain what they are. The Elohen, Pia Aretz, the mouth of the land, or the mouth of the ground, that swallowed Korach and his congregation. Pia Be'er, the mouth of the well that gave water to the Jewish people during the 40 years in the desert. Ufiha Aton, the mouth of the female donkey that spoke to Bilam. For those of you who recall that story, right? The Akeshet, the rainbow, the Haman, the man that they ate in the desert when they left Egypt for 40 years. The Hamate, the staff that Moshe used to perform the miracles. The Hashamir, a very unique warm, not Yitzhak Shamir. Shamir here is a very unique warm, and I'll, I'll tell you what it's all about. Haktav a special writing that we have, the Lashona Kodesh writing. A the written form of that, that was on the tablets, Behaluchot, the tablet themselves. The Yeshomrim, Afamazikim, some say even the demons were created then, and that we have to talk a lot about demons. Ukvuratosha Moshe, the burial. Not necessarily the burial location, but the, the way Moshe was buried. 
ואילו של אברהם אבינו, the ram of אברהם אבינו during the Akedah, ויש אומרים אף צוות בצוות עשויה, and some even say, some have the opinion, that even the first pair of tongues, tongues, T-O-N-G-S, okay, very unusual list. The first items in the list are miraculous. The last items are not necessarily so miraculous, but they're unique. So I, I, that's why I prefer to use the word unique. Unique means it's, it's singular. It's very, very different than your typical. Different than the typical because basically the creation of the world functions. The, everything here that we know as part of creation functions by a certain set of rules and laws that govern them. That's what physics is all about. Physics teaches us about the rules of how physical things function or operate. Chemistry also on a different level. And so does biology on a different level. The rules, and we all know there are rules, just look at the weather. You can pretty much predict some things. They don't know everything 100%, but there is a certain pattern. So let's go back to the very beginning. So what we have here are very unique creations that were created when Ben Hashem Ashot. It's an in-between time. In Yiddish they say, Nishtahin Nishtaher. What that means, it's not, six, it's not during the six days, it's not on Shabbat. It's not here, it's not there. It's in-between. So what are they? Well, you have Piha Aretz. So before we begin with what's so unique about the land, the ground opening up, what some of these have in common is that these are one-time occurrences. One-time occurrences meaning that you may, not have, you may not have heard or seen it anymore besides that one time, that particular occurrence. Whereas many things in creation occur, recur continuously, right? Because after all, when, it, when, when Hashem created the world, if you read the parashat, parashat Bereshit, in the beginning it says, Asher bara elokim la'asot. La'asot? What, what's la'asot? Yeah, to continue to reproduce itself. So we have the earth ro rotating on its axis continuously. We have the sun. We have Baruch Hashem's sun every day, unless you live in London, of course. Mm -hmm. Then you don't enjoy it, right? But we have, we have many, many things on a daily basis. Unless, of course, something interferes. It's there, right? There's cycles, the seasons. You put a seed in the ground, you get a fruit. You get a tree and full of fruit. I mean, there's, everything is there. La asot. So Hashem, what did Hashem do in creation? He made the avtipus, the prototypes, as it's called in English. The prototypes, right? The main parent of the first tree, the first man, everything the first. But he gave them the ability to reproduce, to copy themselves. Incredible. Cells. The cells copied. Cells die. Cells copied themselves incredibly. You have a photocopy machine in you <laughs> that basically knows exactly to reproduce the same DNA exactly of everything that's there. Hashem made it the first time, and then he put it into the system that the system handles itself. You put a tomato seed in the ground, you're not going to get green pepper, right? You're going to get the tomatoes. Hopefully, you'll get the tomatoes if the, sn if the snails or the, or, the, or the squirrels don't eat it, right? You're going to get that. So that's La Asot. However, embedded or programmed into any part of nature, Hashem, believe it or not, also programmed the ability for nature to freak out. Forgive me for using that word. It just, it's, a, it's a powerful word in English. It you know, people are freaked out. So nature sometimes freaks out. And then you have tornadoes and you have hurricanes. And that's not nature. That, I mean, that's... Nature freaking out. That's nature going against the rules. You, since when are you supposed to have destructive winds? Wouldn't it be nice if we had just rain at night and just not, flood, not, not, not to flood the streets, just a little bit to irrigate the land, to clean up the streets, right? No, but sometimes you have floods. Sometimes you have tsunamis. I mean, this is not natural. So what's that from? So that is nature, but with a special chip that Hashem programmed at the beginning freak out when I tell you to, okay? Mm -hmm. So Hashem programmed nature, which is rules, to sometimes, sometimes change its rules. But if it doesn't call upon them, they don't do it. On their own, they don't change the rules. They are programmed to just follow the rules. Have, have you ever seen a dog sniff the grass? 
I was always curious, why, what's this dog looking for there? Unless you have a dog, you probably don't even know what he's doing sniffing the grass. Does anybody have a clue why dogs sniff the grass? What is he looking for there? There's no treasure there, there's no bone, there's no food. There's nothing there. He's sniffing it. Right. What you have to keep in mind when you see a dog sniffing is that one of the most powerful organs of the dog is the smell. And that's what they use them to, to look for drugs. A dog is very, very strong with smell. Every animal has something else. Dogs smell. They don't necessarily have the greatest eyesight. Eagles do, right? Dogs have good smell. So apparently he's very sensitive to something there. Maybe some other dog, some other cat, some other animal was there. And he wants to leave his own scent too. This is mine. You know, there's all kinds of hajbonot that dogs have. <laughs> but the point is, there's definitely a reason for him to do that, and guess what? So his father and mother did the same thing. <laughs> and his children did the same thing. It's programmed. It's all part of nature. A dog will remain a dog. Right? So Hashem put it into nature to be able to change itself. So, nevertheless, this is all part of Hashem. This is all part of Hashem's creation. Just that it's called something else. It's called Ness. It's called a miracle. These Nisim, that we call Nisim, that are supernatural, against the laws of nature, have also a need and a place in this creation. In other words, don't think that just because Hashem made nature the way it is, everything follows rules. Okay, we don't need a miracle. No, 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 we need miracles. We need nature to, to sometimes do things differently. And the rabbis tell us for a variety of reasons of why, for example, we have thunder and, and lightning. You know, people need to be sometimes scared you know, in, order, in order to straighten them out, in order for the fear of heaven to be instilled in them. Their man sometimes is crooked. He's, he's, you know, his mind is not straight. His heart is not straight. Sometimes you need a shock. And that's what a shock does sometimes. It, it really awa it wakes, it wakes us up. So there's a need for thunder. Otherwise, why, well, Hashem, why did you make a... a you know, on New Year's they have uh, fireworks. <coughs> Hashem has fireworks sometimes when there's thunder, you know, lightning. It's fireworks. Hashem, you, you like fireworks? What is it for? It only does damage sometimes when it hits trees, burns fields. So the rabbis tells us there's a reason for that too. We even make a blessing for that. So when, when you make a blessing, obviously it's because it serves a purpose. Hashem created it for a reason. So let's begin with the list then. Piha Aretz. The mouth of the land, the mouth of the ground that swallowed up Korach. That was an open miracle. Don't ever think that this was a geological uh, fault like the San Andreas Fault. Don't think that this was a fissure in the ground, where you know, sometimes it splits. No. It actually, there was nothing there before. The Midrash describes it opened up, and right after it swallowed Korach and his congregation. If you know the story, remember all of you know the story of Korach, how he opposed Moses, right? 250 men. What is that? With 250 men. Right, with all his congregation, his people. And of course, uh, it was a tremendous Chilul Hashem, the creation of, of God's name. I mean, Hashem said, you know, I want Moshe, I want Aaron, I don't want anybody else, you know, in that position. And they were from Shevet Levi, which is unusual because usually the troublemakers were the Erev Rav. You know, the multitudes, the ones that joined the bandwagon and converted. So therefore, it was a very, very sad uh, incident. But Hashem had to make it, Hashem wanted to make it clear that there should be no doubts after that. No more resistance. So how do you convince them? You gotta make something sometimes powerful. All of a sudden the ground opened up and nobody said, oh, it must be that there's an earthquake. No, it became so obvious that everybody, of course, hopefully learned the lesson then. So some times today people think that things happen because of nature and that's unfortunate. And that's only because people's faith has become so weakened. 
that they attribute everything to nature, and then it's just nature. It's not God. That's too bad, because in the past, not too long ago, even the non-Jewish world believed that these are acts of God. Even the insurance companies tell you, we won't cover acts of God. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Obviously, they, you know, they'll write anything just to cover themselves. Yeah, whether they believe it, it's a different story. But it's acts of God. So Piha Aretz, the creation of that ability for the land to open up, that miraculous event of the future, is not just incidental, it's purposeful. Hashem knew that this will happen. He prepared it from before. And it's something which is not part of nature of the six days. It's something that it has one occurrence. And there's a need for that occurrence. And that occurrence will be with Korach. But that occurrence in itself serves as a reminder to everybody else, future generations, that there is punishment or retribution to the wicked. You don't get away with it. At some point, you pay. So that serves a lesson. It's not just get rid of them. It's not just it's coming to them. It serves a purpose, as we said before. There's a reason for everything. And this serves the purpose of reminding us there is retribution to the wicked. Next. The next one is Piha Be'er. Piha Be'er is the mouth of the well. How did Am Yisrael drink water in the desert? Well, you're going to say there's a lot of ponds. There's not a lot of ponds of water. There are no lakes in Sinai. Rock. Right? No, at one occasion it was from the rock. There was various occasions where there was some miracle performed in order to get the water. But generally, on a regular basis, our tradition says that there was a Be'er of Miriam. It's called Be'erash and Miriam. That traveled with them wherever they went. There was some, so, 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 some sort of spring that actually traveled with them. Imagine the spring on the ground going wherever they are. You stop here, you were able to draw water from that spring. It's a miracle. I mean, leaving Egypt was a miracle. 40 years in this was a miracle. There were many miracles. This is one. But obviously, this is a very unusual type of miracle. You can't explain it just like, oh, there's water, because there isn't water everywhere. Oh, well, there is water underneath, because there's the, the table of water everywhere. If you go, if you, deep, if you dig deep enough, you'll find water. That's true. But we're talking about a be'er. We're not talking about just the water table. We're talking about the water coming out on its own. You don't have to dig for it. And this, the rabbi tells us, was Bishut Miriam, that she sang the Shira when they left Egypt, when they crossed the sea, the, street, the sea split. And he, she, with her women, they sang the Shira, their own Shira. So that be'er was in her merit. That be'er provided water to the Jews for 40 years. And what happened after that? Well, after Miriam passed away, it ceased to exist. And according to the Kabbalah, today you can find the be'er of Miriam you know where? In the Kinneret, in the Lake Kinneret. And if you are able to spot it and you drink from it, you will become very wise. So you want to go on a tour? <laughs> Find it? Yes. Become wise? Yeah. <laughs> some, some big, big righteous rabbis were able to see it from a distance. They claim they were able to see something in the water. And they say, oh, that, there's, there she is. Sometimes you can see something from a distance. So it's, it's somewhere there. And supposedly, if you take water from that spot, it's, it's, that water has some very, very special qualities. So that Be'er is miraculous. That Be'er provided them with water in a miraculous way for 40 years. And uh, this Be'er in itself is indicative of their Sakhar for the Tzadikim. The reward for the righteous. Just like the, the mouth, the opening of the ground is retribution for the wicked, this signifies the reward to the righteous. It was that Hashem provides for the righteous at all times, not only in Olam Hase, but also He will reward them in Olam Abba in the world to come. All right. Next. Piha Aton. Piha Aton is very interesting. I don't think you'll ever see anything like this. It's the mouth of the donkey, the female donkey, that all of a sudden, out of the blue, began to talk. To who? To Bil'am. Donkeys don't talk. 
I know some people that are like donkeys, you know, who talk, but you know. <laughs> but a real donkey doesn't talk, right? So what's this donkey doing talking? What's, you know what's the most unusual, what's the most difficult thing to understand? Well, not difficult. Some, it, it's just, it's, it's incredible that here Bil'am hears his donkey talking to him and he's not amazed. He actually talks back. <laughs> he's like, so what? Did I hear you talk? No. He's, he's not surprised. I, this man, obviously Bil'am, was immersed in Tum'am, immersed in witchcraft. So he wasn't very, very surprised that these kind of things can happen. I mean, you have, you have a, you, there is a kind of kishuv where the skull talks to you, a skull of a dead man. Even today, that can be done. Right? But it's a sur, it's forbidden for us to get involved in these kind of things. So here he has an animal talking to him, so he figures, okay, maybe this animal is possessed by a spirit. I don't know what he was thinking, but he wasn't thrown back. Most people would go crazy, they may run away even. But he wasn't. So what's this piha aton doing? Hashem created the piha. Remember, we're talking about things Hashem created Ben Hashem Ashot. So piha aton, the opening of this donkey, to talk to Bilam at some point. What this donkey is doing is humiliating Bilam. Bilam, you see, you're, you think you, you have this ability to curse? I mean, that is what, what they're hiring him for, right? They're hiring him to go curse the Jews. You think you can really control your speech? No. Speech is not from man, speech is from above. As eventually happens, Bilam tries to curse and all the curses are converted to blessings, right? Mm -hmm. So Pia Aton, this creation of the ability to speak by a mule, is very unusual. Very, very, totally, I mean, we don't see it anymore. This one-time thing is to teach us a very valuable lesson. Not only is speech a gift from Hashem to mankind, no other animal has speech, and I know you have, you've heard parrots and dolphins, this is not real speech, it's just a mode of communicating. Real speech, where there's language, words, sentences, pronunciate, pronunciated in a certain way, it's only human. And that speech is a gift from Shamayim, given to us through the neshama. Once the neshama enters the physical body, it becomes, as the Targum says, on the words, nefesh haya, in Sefer Bereshit, leruach min malela, it became a, a spirit that can talk. So that commu communication is a very powerful tool that human beings have that was given to us by Hashem. So piha, ton here, the speech is not just, a, it's not just speech, it's speech being used by an animal to communicate to this man, listen, don't think you're such a big shot. Don't think that you have any koach. That koach is from Hashem. Look at it. Look at it. That koach was just given to me. And that's what Shalom Melech says in Mishle Le'adam Marchei Lev Umi Hashem Ma'anil Hashem. Man, man has the ability to process his thoughts, to think, to prepare a speech, but how it comes out, Me'ashem Ma'anil Hashem. How he expresses himself and how it comes out, that's from Shemaim. It doesn't mean that every word that comes out was mina shamayim. It means that Hashem can change it. In other words, a man could utter and say what he planned to say, no problem. It could be it's going to come out exactly how he thought of saying it. But sometimes it may not. And if it does not, it's mina shamayim. So somebody was prepared to say something and he, forget, he forgot to say something. That's mina shamayim. If it needed to be said, he would have remembered to say it. So man prepares his thoughts, of course. We are, it's up to us what we think and what we want to say. But in the end, what comes out may not necessarily be what we wanted to say. So that's a very important idea here that's learned from Piha Aton, that this ability is from Shamayim. Ultimately, this ability has to be looked over, watched over, uh, that we don't contaminate it, that we don't use it for the wrong things, for lashonara, for bad-mouthing people, for cursing. It's a very special gift. But the fact that this came about in such an unusual way, the emphasis here is that was planned way ahead of time. During Ben Hashem of, of the six primordial days, of those first six days, 
Hashem already prepared that, that important lesson for the future. Why? Because this is something which we're not going to need every day. We don't need donkeys talking to us every day. So we're not going to create that during the six days. We're going to create that unusual incident during Ben Hashemashu because it's a one-time thing. It's to teach a certain lesson. Why, why tell us about it? Because it's a miracle. And miracles do exist. In other words, don't think that this is not true. Don't think that this is just a fairy tale. No, Hashem actually prepared this. He had it in mind. He wanted people to learn certain things from that. And that is why He created that ability to, the ability for an animal on a one-time basis to be able to communicate. No, nobody should ever say, that's impossible. It just never happened. We never saw anything like that. Rabbis tell us, lo ra'inu and not ra'ya. Something that you did not see does not mean it does not exist. I don't see dinosaurs today. Does that mean they don't exist? No, they, they mean maybe they don't exist, but they did exist. So not seeing something does not mean it does not exist. <laughs> There's a lot of things we don't see. So don't think this is not possible. Hashem can make anything happen. It's interesting the Gemara tells us about a rabbi who became a widow. A widower, I should say. And uh, his daughter once asked him, Abba, uh, we, we, don't have, uh, we don't have oil for, can for, for the candles for Shabbat. And now the, there's no woman in the house, you know, how are we going to light? He said, we don't have oil. He says, do we have vinegar? He says, yeah. He says, well, how are you going to light with vinegar? He says, whoever said that oil could light can also make vinegar light. Mm -hmm. no. He said that oil should have the ability to light. Whoever said oil can light can say vinegar. Sure. And guess what? That vinegar for that Shabbat <laughs> lit. Mm -hmm. They even say that because I think that daughter of his was very young when his, her mother passed away, that Hashem provided him with mother's milk in his body to give to her. Okay, so it says so. Every, in other words, everything is possible. If Hashem wills it, so it's possible. Why not? Don't try it. <laughs> I don't think you're going to get too much, too far. <laughs> All right, the next one. The Akeshet. Anybody know what the Keshet is? Keshet is a rainbow. Everybody's excited when they see a rainbow, and they shouldn't. Because a rainbow is not a good sign. A rainbow means that there was supposed to be a Mabul, a big flood. Because that area, region, or country deserves a mabul because of its bad deeds. But Hashem made a promise, a covenant, a brit. After the big mabul, the first one, no more mabul for the entire world. Locally, yes, but not, not for the entire world. And this is my sign that I will put in the clouds. Whenever you see the, the various colors of the rainbow, that is a sign. And we make a beracha, zochera brit when we see it, a special bracha. <coughs> now, the rainbow in itself requires a little bit more analysis, but we don't have the time to do that. But what I mean by analysis is that it's a very interesting phenomenon. What's so interesting about it? It appears to be natural, because all it is is that with the formation of certain conditions in the clouds and precipitation and so forth, <coughs> you will be able, the clouds will be able to act like a prism through which you will see all the colors of the spectrum. All the colors. If you look closely, you can see all the colors of the spectrum, the main colors. <coughs> and that is a natural thing. You can do it yourself artificially. You can, with a prism, you can separate the various uh, light waves, right, that exist. <coughs> Each one has a different wavelength. And that's why we see different colors, simply, different wavelengths. So you can do it too. It's natural. So what's the miracle here? Well, the miracle is that Shem made the conditions right for it. In other words, it's not that this happens. The fact that this happens, we know. If the conditions are such and such, then the colors will appear. Then the light will scatter. It, right with the various wavelengths and you will see various shades but it's the actual incident in order you don't you don't always see a rainbow 
when there are clouds and when there's rain. It has to be, the conditions has to be right. Hmm? Sometimes there's even a double rainbow. Huh? In other words, the conditions have to, I mean, sometimes you see it with your own sprinklers. So it's not something unusual completely. But for Hashem to, for, for, the, for, for the world or for the weather to bring about such a big rainbow with cloud cover, that in itself, that incident is not man-made, it's for sure not man-made. It's not, it's not physical, it's Mishamayim. So that's what Hashem says. When you see that, you should know, I made it. Yeah, but the clouds did. No. The clouds, of course, are the medium through which Hashem makes it. Yes, it's a fact. You can prove that. But who, call, who told the clouds to be in such a position? Who made the conditions just right in order to produce a rainbow? Said so Hashem, I did after the Mabul. What that tells us is that before the Mabul, during the time of the early part of creation, there was no rainbow, and there was no ability to even make a rainbow. In other words, somehow the conditions of the atmosphere were different. That could not produce the rainbow. There was no need for it. But what I began to say about the rainbow being interesting, that we don't really have that much time to go into, is the fact that it splits into various colors. Why colors? And the whole subject of colors is, part, is in the Kabbalah. No. What is red? What does red represent? What does white represent? What is green? What is yellow? And some colors are, by the way, are combinations of other colors. It's not that they're not unique. You basically have white, green, and red. And then you have combinations. Orange, right? Yellow, right? All kinds of other combinations. So, what is the significance of these colors? And especially when you have seven or eight what is that number seven? We've talked about seven many, many times in the Kabbalah. Seven appears quite a bit, you know. And seven or eight, the numbers represent different things. So on a deeper level, on a deeper Kabbalistic level, we're talking about the essence of creation that is being displayed through a rainbow. What do you mean by the essence? The essence, what I, what I mean by essence, I'm saying, I'm meaning the actual creation as it came about Kabbalistically, it came about through the various sefirot. And the sefirot, the spheres, or the attributes of God of the olam ha'asiyah, of the physical world, not this, not this spiritual world, consists of seven sefirot instead of ten. So the number seven is a very special number. So even though you have the main colors, which are three, I believe, you do have the total of seven, and you can go into eight. I mean, depending on how big the rainbow is and how much we can perceive, because we don't perceive every little detail. And I have some very interesting news to tell you. Very few people are familiar with this Zohar. Very, very few people. There's a Zohar that says, Mashiach will come only after you see a bright rainbow, so bright that the colors are shiny. Okay? So there will be some, we do, we do know that there will be some strange and unique phenomena in the world, especially astronomical phenomena, that will be the final indicator and a very powerful sign that Mashiach is coming. So we're expecting that any day. So it could be that there will be all kinds of comets, because there's a tradition of comets too, all kinds of phenomena. But remember, we're talking about rainbow, there is something about a rainbow mentioned too. So rainbow is din, in a sense, but it's also rachamim. It's din because of the potential of din, of judgment. But Hashem says, I also have the attribute of rachamim, means I'm not doing anything. I made a promise and I keep it. I won't destroy this place. But it's a time, of course, to think about our deeds. It's a time to reflect a little bit. Look, perhaps uh, something is not right. And this is a... This is a way that Hashem is communicating. There are other ways Hashem communicates to us, but this is one way. Okay, next one. The Haman. I think all of you heard about the man. The man is, in English called the manna, is that bread that came down in Shemaim that was very tasty. Like a cracker and honey transparent in color. 
rabbis tell us in the Midrash it had all the taste. If you wanted it to taste like Choresh, it would also taste like Choresh. <laughs> right. Whatever you want. Gorbe Sabzi, Gorbe Sabzi, right? Yeah. All the goodies. Yeah. If you wanted it to taste like Cholent. <laughs> Anything you wanted. Anything. That's very unusual. For you to have in mind something and it actually tastes like that. That was good. <laughs> but besides that, it was very funny. And no matter how much you ate of it, you ate five pounds of it, you didn't have to go to the restroom. Mm -hmm. It somehow was absorbed into the body. That's great. Perfect. If you can only invent something like that today, that's the best diet, right? <laughs> Everybody collected exactly what they needed for the family. You took a lot more, the leftovers spoiled. You, you took only what you needed. You took exactly what you needed. This man, of course, lasted throughout the 40 years. This man was Powerful proof and a very important lesson for the Jew to learn. Parnasah is min hashamayim. Bread is min hashamayim. Hashem can give you parnasah no matter any way you can think of. Guy, a guy just, just gave up, for example. He says, I can't, can't do business with this uh, fabric. There's too much competition you know, between the Armenians and the Persians downtown. And then the Koreans are coming in. And then the Chinese are coming in. What am I going to do? You know, sometimes you are lost. What can I do? You know, this guy is raising the rent, right? Uh -huh. What are you going to do? All of a sudden, Hashem puts in your mind, you know what? Go to Guangzhou, right? That's where everybody's going. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and buy toothpicks. Toothpicks? Yeah, you got a good deal on toothpicks. And sure enough, when you come here, you're able to unload them and sell them for a big profit. I'm just giving you a, <laughs> a wild <laughs> example. Parnassá can happen in any way. And you say, no, I'm not going to go to Guangzhou. I have a PhD in, uh, in psychology. Who cares? Don't you want to, don't you want to have Parnassá? You know, some people, uh, they, they, they're so into their, their degree and their schooling is that they're not willing to change careers. Sometimes you've got to just change careers. So what? Be a little flexible. And Hashem does guide us. But if a person is a stubborn mule, like the mule of, uh, of Bilam, even though she was stubborn in her mind. If somebody is resistant, then obviously, you know, he, he's going he's gonna to lose out. You sometimes got to listen to your intuition. Sometimes got to listen to Hashem talks to us, sends us all kinds of signs. And we've got to be flexible. Flexibility is, is sometimes a very important characteristic. Sometimes you've got to be consistent and resist pressures to change. Yes, very, very much too. But sometimes you've got to be flexible. And Parnassah is one of those things that's Parnassah is Minashamayim and it can happen in different ways. No money this year, now what? Well, all of a sudden your aunt thinks of you and she leaves you an inheritance. That makes up for six months that you didn't make any money. All kinds of ways. It could happen all kinds of ways. You found the money. Okay. Man is, came down in Hashemayim, Hashem did not give them actual bread, loaves of bread, and he could have done that, right? To Prove to them, to teach to them, Parnassai is Shamaim. Of course, you've got to go to school, perhaps. Of course, you've got to learn a trade. Of course, you've got to go for the interview. You've got to do your, your ishtadut, your effort. But whether you succeed in this or not, whether the guy accepts you or not, that's Minas Shamaim, if it's meant for you or not. So they're receiving man. This man, the ability for the man to come down was created by Nashamashot. It was going to be a unique experience for Am Yisrael, an important lesson for them to learn the Parnassai is Minas Shamaim. What happened to the man? Some of it, Moshe is told, save as a souvenir. Put it in the jar. Eventually, Yirmiyahu used to use this jar. He used to take it out from where it was hidden to show the people. You see, you complain about Parnassah. Look, your forefathers had food for 40 years all every day. You look, look at this jar. Here's the man. I, it was saved from back then. He, Hashem provided for them. You don't think He can provide for you today. You have to work on Shabbat. Come on. What's the excuse? <coughs> That's not going to make it happen. Hashem can make it happen in one day. As I told you perhaps several times, you know, a guy who's in, is in jewelry and he has a nice 12 karat diamond that's pretty clean, he can make a lot of money from that, right? 12 carats? The profit on that is a lot. How long will it take him to sell? It could be five minutes. 
if the right buyer comes through the door. And in five minutes, he's made enough money to keep him going for two years. Do you know that? It could happen. Did he have to work on Shabbat? No. But people make this mistake. Oh, I have to work on Shabbat. Shabbat Rabbi is my best day, they tell me. They don't realize that all the money that was made on Shabbat is going to be lost through root canals. The transmission of the car is going to go kaput. Right? And all kinds of other problems. A neighbor is going to sue you. Oh, Chaz Shalom, all kinds of things can go. That, that money eventually, a year from now, too. It doesn't have to be the next day. It could be six years from now. The money that was made back then, Shabbatot, is gone. All of a sudden, it's gone. This, people don't tie the two together. And Hashem, of course, does not do it, make it so obvious, because otherwise, our free will would be taken away. It can't be obvious. But that's what happens. I had this couple come to me, you know. They were complaining, you know, about all kinds of issues and Parnassah and... And they have, uh, they own a, uh, a uh, car wash in South El Monte. So you, you, call, you keep it open on Shabbat? You say, Rabbi, Shabbat's the best day. Mm-hmm. Again, the best, same story again, the best day. I can show you all the cash. I can bring it to you, too, he says. I thought, don't, don't bring me the cash. You don't realize that, yeah, it could be the best day, but if you keep it open on Shabbat, that money will disappear. You're complaining about Parnassah. The first place to start is with the Shabbat. That's where you start. No, Rabbi, I think I have somebody put us on evil eyes, kishuv, witchcraft. Why, why are you blaming those things? Now, I saw a woman look at me the other day. I was at the wedding and she was staring at me. Why, be, why, why think like that? Why think in that direction? Yes, there are things like that, but first blame yourself. Don't blame other people, other women. Right? Kishuv, Ainara, all these things. Should I do Hamsa? Should I wear something? No. <laughs> you have an amulet? <laughs> Keep Shabbat, I told him. That's what the Krat Shabbat Lechuven and Lechaki, he mekor habracha, the source of all blessings is Shabbat. It says so clearly. Look, the man didn't come down on Shabbat, he came down Friday, so you have double. Why double? Because Shabbat, you don't go out, you don't fetch for food. So you get double on the Friday, don't worry, you'll get it, you'll have enough. So the, these are valuable lessons. These incidents, that occurred, even though this occurred for more than one day, actually, mine occurred for 40 years, still the ability for that to happen and the reason for that to happen was all pre-programmed before. Then we have Hamate. What's the Mate? The staff of Moshe was a very interesting staff. You know what a staff is, right? Like a, like a stick. Mm-hmm. It was made out of sapphire. There's a whole midrash in Pirkei de Rabilez, I believe, that says how Moshe ever got hold of that. Because the first one to have it was Adam Arishon. And somehow, it went down all the way from father to son until Moshe somehow got a hold of it. Anyway, Moshe performed with this mate the various miracles that he performed. So I was, was wondering, why does, need a, why does he need a staff to perform miracles? Just do abracadabra with your hands. Use your hands. What do you need? You need a stick? I mean, you're physically able. You can walk, you can move your hands, you can talk. Why do you need a mate to perform miracles? And perhaps one explanation is as follows. Hashem wants us to be very, very careful not to attribute any special qualities to the human being. He, a human being is not a god. And there were human beings who thought they were gods. And if there was no mate, and he would just talk and use his hands, he might think himself that he's a god all of a sudden. No, this Mate, which had the names of God inscribed on it, this is what was doing the miracles. The miracles are from Hashem, not from him. Moshe is not making the miracles. Hashem is making the miracles. He's just the medium through which the miracles are occurring. So this was a very special Mate, and this Mate was prepared back then as well, a Mate that will serve a certain purpose for a limited amount of time, and it succeeded. It succeeded in, in, of course, in convincing Am Yisrael after seeing all the miracles by Aminu Bashem and Moshe Avdo, that they believed in, in Moshe and, and, and in God. Then we have the Hashamir. Shamir was a very unique worm, about one third of an inch long, that was incredible. Incredible. You have a rock, big rock. You ever go to the Kotel Amaravi? Some of them are tons. You put it on top and it's split it in half. 
like a laser. What do you need a shamir for? Because there were several items that cannot, you could not use metal on. To build the Mizbeach, the Torah says, Lo tanif barzel. Do not put metal on it. The, the Mizbeach, the altar of the Bet HaMikdash, was intended to bring peace. And the metal was created to destroy and to kill, unfortunately. It shouldn't. I mean, you can use it to cut meat too. But still, metal is destructive. Mizbeach brings peace between us and Hashem. Don't put that which destroys over that which brings peace. So make the Mizbeach with stones that are chiseled, that are really not chiseled, because you don't want to use metal on it. Shlomo Melech somehow, for some reason, either was told or chose, I'm not, we're not sure, to build the entire first temple, which is built without any metal at all. Not just the Mizbeach, the entire Bet HaMikdash. Besides the Bet Hamidash, besides the Mizbech, what else was used? They, did they use the Shamir to cut? The, I mean, that's what the Shamir was for, to cut instead of metal. They used it for the Pituche Chotam of the Avnei Achoshen. The Avnei Achoshen, the breastplate of the Kohen Gadol, had, had stones embedded in it for each tribe. It had the letters of the tribes chiseled out, but not chiseled out with any metal or any tool. You, they used the Shamir to chisel out or to make the, the names of the tribes in the stone. So the, all that stone is being pretty much prepared with the Shamir as well. How do you find the Shamir? King of demons. Yeah, he had to employ demons for that. Exactly. There's a whole story about how he basically forced the demons to reveal to him where the Shamir was. So how do you store this Shamir? Whatever you put it, it breaks. So the rabbis and the Gemara tell us that the only way you can store it safely is in a jar made out of lead. Now you, now you know why lead is good for x-rays too, right? <laughs> Somehow the Gemara says lead is also good for the shamir. It won't crack the lead. Mm. You store it in a jar of lead with tufts of wool somehow to, to just to, to protect it or to hold it and you stuff it with, uh, with barley. I guess as a food for it or something. And that's how you, pres that's how you store it. After, of course, the, the Bet HaMikdash was destroyed, the first one, the Shamir disappeared. Mm. But this was a very unusual thing. There were many, many, there were actually more things that were, were very unusual. Now, maybe I'll mention one or two if we have time. These, however, were created Ben Hashem Ashot. In other words, they were purposeful, they were unique, serving one purpose. And they were miraculous. I mean, this, is, this does not follow any rules or laws of nature that we know. But it had a purpose. Then we have the Aktav v'hamikhtav. Ktav is the letters of Lashon HaKodesh. As you know, the Jewish nation, the Hebrew language, used or employed two kinds of alphabets. One was called Ktav. Levena, Octav Ivri, the old script that looks a little bit like Phoenician, eh, closely resembling a little bit of Greek as well. Nobody uses it today except for the Samaritans. That was in use during the first temple era. If you look at the Bar Kochva coins, you look at the old Hebrew script of that era, you'll see the old Hebrew script. You don't see Aleph Bet that we see today. You see a different kind of alphabet. The Aleph Bet that we have today is called Ktav Ashuri. Some say Ashuri means Assyria, some say Ashuri means the beautiful Ktav. What we do know is that that's the original Ktav, what we have today. That's the one that, according to most opinions, the Luchot, the tablets, contain that script. But what's unique about the Ktav is that it's not just letters made up by man. These letters are created by God. There is a book in the, of Kabbalah called Sefer Yetzira that is attributed to having been authored by Avraham Avinu, at least the basics of it. And uh, that book talks about the letters. That book talks about the creation of the world being created with the 22 letters. And if you look at the Lashona Kodesh letters, the Ketav HaShuri, you will see the way it's written in the Torah, of course, not the way we write it today in script, is that even an Aleph, is co composed of three letters. You have the slanted 
leg, which is really like a vav, then you have a yud on top and a yud in the bottom, upside down. And what's that? That's 26. Yud and yud is 10 and 10 is 20, and vav is 6, that's Hashem Hashem. So the Aleph has the name of Hashem in the formation of the letter. Hashem is one. So many things, Rabbi Akiva used to be Doresh, Tilei, Tilei, Shel Alachot, many Alachot, just from the crowns, the details of the letters, or the formation of the letters. So we know that the letters, the way they are formed, the way they, they stand, the way they make up words, that's the Ketav, that was created then too. Language and alphabet is something which is unique. And you probably know that not all the nations in the early days had an alphabet. They had to draw pictures like the hieroglyphics. Right? So this alphabet of all alphabets is the most unique because it's, it's from Shemaim. It's not man-made. Every other alphabet is man-made. People decided, like the Sumerians did with cuneiform, let's decide this stands for Abba, Ka Kala, Tala, Bana, Fala, whatever, you know, vowels, consonants, you know, two strokes, three strokes, four strokes. That's what cuneiform is about. Cuneiform is what the Sumerians used, what the old Persians used. And you can see it in the old, in, in the museums in Iran, they have some stones and all kinds of things with that kind of writing called cuneiform. The history of the older kings. But this is Chochmat Hashem. This Ketav is unique, it's special. It's it has meaning to it. Then you have the Mikhtav. Mikhtav is the formation or how the letters were actually written or, or how they, they were embedded in the tablets themselves. Because according to our tradition, you were able to see them from both sides. They were see-through. We're talking about rock, we're talking about sapphire, we're talking about mineral. And somehow in a miraculous way, the mikhtav was see-through from both sides. And even though you have some letters like the samach in the, in the, in the, in the closing mem that are just a rim, if you, if you cut through both sides, then the, then the middle will fall out, right? The, middle, the, the, the stone in the middle will come, well, if you cut through both sides, it will come out, it will fall out. You understand what I mean? A samach is like a circle. Same thing with the, the mem at the end of a word, not the mem in the beginning of a word, but the, or the middle, but the, end, the mem in the, in the end is also pretty much like a square. So you have a square or a circle, so if you cut through the two sides of the stone, and you chisel it out, then that, that means what's in the middle will fall out. But it didn't. So all the otiyot, all these letters, especially these letters that have a middle, they miraculously stood in their position. Even though it was chiseled, it was through and through, you were able to read it from both sides. So the whole, the whole mikhtav, the way it was written, was, very, was a miraculous way, and that was prepared back then too. Then you have the luchot, the luchot, Aluchot meaning the actual tablets. The tablets were miraculous. Tablets, according to our tradition, uh, were so special that had they not been broken by Moshe later on, unfortunately, because Amisal, you know, they were involved in the sin of the golden calf, the first set were broken. Had they not been broken, we were told, whatever we would learn, we would never forget. And it was worse because they were made by God. The second set was made by Moshe. That's man-made, man-made. Whatever is man-made is not as good as God-made, right? It's divinely made. So the luchot were already prepared before. Rabbi tells us the Torah was there even before creation, in a sense. But everything is being readied. The whole creation is being ready. The luchot are being ready. The ketav, everything is being ready because it's, it's going to serve a purpose. But it's, it's, it's ben Hashem Hashem because it's not your natural, regular, physical thing that the world has a need for it on a regular basis. This is special. This is for Am Yisrael. This is a, mir a miracle. So it's, it's made separately. And last but not least, the Yeshomrim, some say that you can also add to this list three, uh, four more items. Afamazikin, the demons. What are the demons? The demons were created towards the end, which means they don't have a body. They're not, so, they're not complete. Because they're still made in between the six days and Shabbat. So Shabbat is spiritual, spirit only. Six days is physical. 
And in between means that they have a, uh, half a body. So the rabbis tell us demons are semi-human, semi-angels. They have certain abilities like angels, like flying, like knowing certain events in the future, appearing and disappearing in various forms, but they also behave like humans. They reproduce, they also die, and they also eat. And they don't eat rice and beans and things like we do. No, they have their own kinds of food. So demons exist, and you can see some of them on Melrose. Yeah, yeah. They, you know, they are around here somewhere, you know. But usually they're in rural places where people are not around, usually. What are they for? To punish. Hashem uses them to punish people sometimes. They, they, they have, there's different kinds of them, and, and I can spend an hour or two just talking about them, but we're not going to do it now. What the purpose of demons are, there's different kinds of them. Many of them are called mashchitim, they're destructive. There are some Jewish demons, by the way. Jewish, Jewish demons. That means they pray and they do things like we do. There are some that are more human-like, and there are some that look more like animals. And some of them have feet of goats. Some of them have hair, some of them don't have hair. Some of them are very scary. Some of them you would never know that they're demons if you look at them. But usually we don't see them, Baruch Hashem. The rabbis tell us if we would see them, we would go crazy because there's so many of them. They serve a purpose. They're a limited purpose. They're created in between. Again, twilight. Ben Hashem Ashot, because they're not perfect. They're not perfected like the human being is much more perfected, much more complete. They're semi. And to, in order to be able to have that semi existence of semi-human, semi-angels, they're created at that point. Obviously, Hashem knows why He put them at that point, but that's the idea, that they're not completely human, so they're not com created together with humans. But they still have, they still serve a purpose. Then we have Vuratosh and Moshe, we have the burial place of Moshe. It's not so much the burial place, the commentaries tell us, but it's the way he's buried. How is Moshe buried? So the Torah says, nobody will ever know his burial spot. Hashem did not want people to know. The Romans looked for him. The Gemara says the Romans once sent a, a group to look for him. When they, when they thought he was there, it appeared to him he was on top. When they went up, up to the mountain, it looked like it was down there. Somehow, they were getting mixed signals. Every single time they were moving around, they couldn't figure it out, no matter what they did. Because Hashem did not want them to discover it. Why not? Well, just all you have to do is go to Sinai. And you go to Sinai Desert, where they, one opinion is where Mount Sinai is, and what will you see there, close by, at the foot of the mountain? A church. <coughs> a church, yeah. Right? There's a monastery there. An old monastery. If the rabbis tell us if they knew where Moshe was buried, they would go and put their idols there and make a whole big deal out of it, like they've done to other things. Hashem, of course, did not want that to happen, that he should be worshipped, and they should do whatever they want to do to him. So he therefore did not disclose his burial place. Even though he gave many signs and indicators where it is, approximately, you can, you can never find it. So this is the, the, the Kvuratosha Moshe, the ability. Now, everybody, I'm sure, asks the question, what's so unique about this? Why? create that during Ben Hashem Ashot. What's so special about the way Moshe is buried? Okay, so we know the reason why. But why do that this way? I would like to explain that Kvuratosh Moshe is not too much different than many other things in this world that Hashem made and does not want us to see. One of them is a fascinating river called the Sambation. The Sambation is a river that is, that is made out of sand, that throws sand six days a week, and right before Shabbat, it subsides. And this river surrounds the children of Moshe. I have a whole topic about that called the Ten Lost Tribes. You can listen to it, it's online, of where we think that river is. But the question is, the big question is, why don't we see it today when it was observable years and years ago? The reason for that is Hashem does not want to see it, us to see it and to know of it for some reason. So even with satellites and even with explorations, with National Geographic going to every corner of the world, they're still not going to find it if Hashem doesn't want to, you to see it. In Kabbalah, there's a concept called Ro'e Veno Nira. There are beings or things in this world that can see, but we can't see them. So they exist, but Hashem does not want us to see them. They see us, we can't see them. So therefore, the Kvuratosha Moshe, the way Moshe was buried, the ability to, to know it's there but not to be able to see it, Hashem created that too, Ben Hashem Hashem. And there are other things just like it, like Kvuratosha Moshe. 
Then we have Elosh Avram Avinu, the ram of Avram Avinu. As you know the story of the Akedah, Avram is told by Hashem to take Yitzchak as a sacrifice. Hashem later tells him, yeah, you're not sacrificing your son. I never meant it that way. I was testing you. It was a very big test. Many promises were made that will come out to you through Yitzchak. And here he's, he's, he's blowing it. No. Hashem says, you see that ayah, that ram? That's what I really meant. I don't understand. So why don't you tell me? The ram is the way you bring sacrifices. The ram, we use the shofar from the ram. The ram serves a certain purpose. That man, human beings are not meant to be sacrifices. And this is something, unfortunately, of course, that, you know, throughout the history, many nations and some Jews, unfortunately, fell into this trap that human sacrifice was something good. No, this is not good for a sacrifice. This is a sacrifice. So it's not just that is the lesson of this. Obviously, this is, the isle is being created. We're talking about the isle now being created then to serve a purpose. And it's not just a lesson. And what is that purpose? Don't ever think that, oh, he saw a ram. Great, perfect. I just found something instead. No. This whole thing was by design. The whole episode of Ma'asakeda, the whole trial of taking Abraham through this experience was from back, was already prepared back then. The whole plan, the whole script of the movie, if you want to use that word, was already Ben Hashem Ashot. In other words, that Ma'asakeda is important for future generations. This will be a merit for the Jews. The sacrifice of Abraham Avino, the self-sacrifice of the Jews, the devotion that we have to show to God, goes back to them. The ram itself, obviously, is, is, is the sacrifice, the ultimate sacrifice, which stands for us till today. That zechut is what we talk about, what we pray about, what we ask Hashem to remember. So that whole episode was already prepared from before. And the last one... <laughs> Is a, uh, forgive me to say it, but it's a, the funniest one of all. It's funny because you'll see why. The first pair of tongues, we said. Tongues? What does tongues have to do with it? T-O-N-G-S. Anybody know how do you make tongues? How do you make a tongue? You need fire, right? To make the metal? To form it? You need another pair of tongues to make, the, to make that tongue. So otherwise, how are you going to hold it? You know what they say in English, what came first, the chicken or the egg? The same kind of thing. Who made the first pair of tongues? You needed another pair of tongues. So who made that? Hashem made it. So it's a little funny, this whole thing. Why put this in this list? The first pair of tongues you made, Ben Hashem Ashot. What's going on over here? But there's a deeper meaning, obviously. That Tzvat Tzvat. So yeah, it's not just tongues, because there's other ways you can make a tongue, I'm sure. The point here is raw material. Hashem made the raw material in the beginning of creation. Man was brought into the world to perfect it and to make tools from it. Don't ever therefore say, you human being, I've just discovered something. I've, right? I'm sorry, I've just invented something. You didn't invent anything. You've discovered it. Discovered means something was hidden. The potential was always there to make cars. Why didn't they make cars 500 years ago? They could have saved themselves a lot of headaches and trouble. Think about it. Why just now? It was always there. The technology is this. This is not new stuff. You still have, you had rubber there for the tires. You had metal. What was missing? The knowledge, right? People have discovered what was always there. They did not invent something new. In the very, very beginning, Hashem made the raw material. Even though this is, he's saying this in the list of things being made by Hashem Ashot, in reality, this message is, is more of what was made in the very beginning that is no longer being made now. That's what it's saying. And that is the raw material. All this oil. You know what they say where the oil comes from? Oh, there was so much vegetation in Saudi Arabia. And it once died. And over millions of years, it became oil. That's the only explanation they have. 
What is another possibility? If you believe in creation, then you know that Hashem created the world with all the minerals, whatever we need. We need the gold, we need the copper, and every metal serves a different purpose. Right? Why do they make tires out of rubber? Why not make it out of metal? <laughs> Obviously, the rubber is better for a tire than metal. Obviously, everything has a reason. All this raw material is here for man to use purposefully. Don't make atomic bombs with it, of course. Don't be destructive about it. But you can perfect. Man can perfect the world. But the raw material, he didn't make. You didn't make any raw material. Hashem made it. Don't think you've made everything. No, you've, you're perfecting what was there already before. That's what we're here for. We take the barley and the wheat and we make bread and cookies. Chocolate chip cookies. Tasty cookies. Right? But the raw, <laughs> the raw material was there. It's there. It's growing. But we perfect it. We bake it. We put a lot of work into it. Sugar. It's good. With a cup of coffee. Yes. <laughs> yeah, why not? Enjoy it. Make a beracha. <laughs> but who made it? Hashem made it. So that's, that's the message here at the end of the Mishnah. Is tzavat, not necessarily just the tongues. All the raw material was there. It was there for a purpose. And man is there to perfect it now. What will happen, however, in our times, in, as of the year 1840, the Zohar says, all the gates of wisdom will open up. And as of the year 1840, we have the Industrial Revolution, and that is when all the major inventions came about. Up until then, very little change in the world. A horse and buggy, well, okay, you had a telescope, you had some eyeglasses, and you had ammunition. You had the printing press. Yeah, four or five items, I can count them on my fingers. What happened till then? All of a sudden, boom, uh, pasteurization, you know, we discovered bacteria, electricity. I mean, it's un and you have the train, you have, you have combustion engine, you have the airplanes, you have, it's incredible. Incredible, and every year more and more and more. Do you know what computers looked like 40 years ago? This whole big room, you had a big computer. Today, it's this size. The, the processor, it's incredible. Okay? And we're, we're not done yet. When Mashiach comes, I mean, it seems even more. The point is that all of a sudden, right before Mashiach comes, the Zohar says the gates of wisdom will open up. All of that potential has been there. All of that is Hashem already created. All of that knowledge was n not known, but Hashem will reveal it. So the fact that we're living during these days, this is the greatest sign that Hashem Mashiach is coming. So thank you. Amen.